All right, so I guess, guys, we'll get started again. Um, I think this is the last topic of the day. We're going to talk about how to set the drogue. And believe it or not, this is one of the most technical things that we do as tandem instructors. So hopefully it will be a dynamic conversation and you guys will take away um, some thought-provoking uh, ideas from it because ultimately the setting of the drogue is what starts our path on every tandem jump to either being a successful one or highly unsuccessful. I've said repeatedly in other presentations and here before in the past as well, that as tandem instructors, the skill set that we are judged on is truly the first eight to 10 seconds of every tandem jump. Our exit, our ability to fly our body, called tandem free fall, and then set a drogue. Once those three things have been accomplished and we are safely under drogue fall, the majority of our responsibilities as tandem instructors are essentially over with the exception of maintaining altitude awareness and deploying at an appropriate altitude, which doesn't require a tremendous amount of skill, if you'd agree with me. What does require skill and what we are ultimately judged on as instructors is our ability to set up in the door, exit, achieve stability, and set the drogue. Last time I was here, we talked about tandem exits. We focused on that middle piece exit the aircraft and achieve stability. What we're focusing on now today is the third installment of that, how to set the drogue, how to do it correctly. So that's the intent of this conversation that we're gonna have today. Before I move forward, we see feet. The feet are still touching the aircraft. They're still in contact with the bird. And we see a hand on the drogue, okay? Has anybody been taught to exit an aircraft this way? Negative. Has anybody ever seen someone leave an aircraft this way? Positive, yes. We're gonna keep going back to this theory that the way you were trained, the, the level, the bar that you had to, uh, to get over to earn your rating may or may not be the same bar that you or the people you work with are currently operating under. I promise you this individual did not exit an aircraft during his course this way because I, I know the examiner that trained him and I know the standards that they have are very, very high. Yet shortly after his course, he went to his home drop zone and started leaving the aircraft with his hand on the drogue. So where does all this come from? Well, complacency basically. Complacency and a lack of confidence in our ability to fly our bodies, tandem free fall, and to physically be able to set the drogue consistently. So drogue setting problems are the logical outcome of a series of illogical decisions and actions regarding the drogue. Anytime we have a bad drogue set, it's not accidental. It's not black magic. It is absolutely the logical outcome of a series of bad decisions. And we're gonna cover what those bad decisions are so we can hopefully either correct them or better yet, avoid them. And that's the, essentially the process or the concept of the presentation. Just a quick little background on me, which I probably should have included before the last presentation. I've been working with Mark at UPT as the tandem program director for the last five years. I've been training tandem instructors and examiners for the last 12 years and have spent the entirety of that 12 years thinking about and overanalyzing all the different components and, and physical steps that we make as tandem instructors to try to figure out the best course of action for us to have the highest consistency in positive outcomes. That things go right every time instead of wrong every time. So, just to recap, the sequence of a tandem exit, as I said, it's three different things. First, we leave the aircraft, then we have to achieve stability, and then set the drogue. Now, <clears throat> oftentimes, achieving stability and setting the drogue happen one right after the other. There's a sequence of leaving the aircraft, we've achieved stability, and we set the drogue. It's a sequence, one, two, three. But unfortunately, there's a trend in our sport today of combining achieving stability and setting the drogue at the same time. If you've ever seen this before, it looks like someone rolling out of an aircraft, blue, green, blue, and they time the drogue throw as they see blue and set the drogue as they're rolling through the exit. Have you guys ever seen that before? Ever been aware of that? Maybe somebody you work with does that. Um, so that's a danger. No one was ever taught to combine achieving stability and setting the drogue. That's the first danger that we have in tandem drogue setting is that we really need to make sure we've achieved stability into the relative wind before we initiate our drogue set. To put the two together is to ask for problems. We do see a high probability or a higher incident rate of drogue entanglements today, tandem instructors throwing drogues around their ankles because they're combining the ability to achieve stability with setting the drogue. They almost need the drogue to get stable. And we're gonna look at that a little bit more as we move forward. So 
four basic uh, subcomponents of this conversation. The first one is folding the drogue. We're going to talk about why the drogue fold is so important, and I'm actually going to do a drogue fold for you here so you can see it. Then we're going to talk about the proper technique for setting the drogue. And then the third one is I want to talk about the mindset of the drogue throw, the mental side of what we do. And some of you might be looking at me going, there's a mental side of setting a drogue? There absolutely is. And by recognizing that and understanding what the mind process is for a good positive drogue throw will help increase the consistency of your drogue sets. And at the end, we'll talk about some conclusions. So in terms of drogue folding, the goal of the drogue fold is twofold. Yeah, sounds right. We want to make sure that when we set the drogue, that the bridle is able to pay out cleanly, that the bridle extends from our tandem pack tray without knotting, without bow tying, without horseshoeing over us, a nice clean payout of the drogue bridle. And the only way we can do that is by folding the drogue correctly. And the technique is in the manual, so you have this available to you after the fact. And then the last part about it, which is the one that is most missed, is a correct orientation in the drogue pocket. You can fold the drogue perfectly, have the bridle payout staged perfectly, but then put the drogue in the pocket upside down, and the whole thing is going to mushroom and explode on you as soon as you pull the drogue off your hip. It won't even have the chance to get out into clean air. So imagine going through all that work, a nice, perfect, great drogue fold, and then it all explodes off your hip because the one thing at the end you failed to do is put it into the pack tray correctly. So I'm gonna turn off the mic so it doesn't squeak. And I'm gonna pull out a drogue here for you guys. You're welcome to come up, have a look. We're gonna talk about how to fold the drogue correctly so that it deploys cleanly every time. Okay. So we're gonna take our drogue we're going to fold it cleanly on its equator. Now again, I have the privilege of not being under a time constraint right now. I'm not on a 20 minute call, so I can give this all of the attention to detail that it needs. But that being said, being on a short call is no excuse for a bad drogue fold. So, we flatten the drogue out, we fold it up the, the equator, we're making a second fold. You'll notice by making that second fold, now the drogue is the length of the pocket. This width is the length of the pocket. So we're setting up for success. We S-fold the bridle. Making our last fold, the four point stitching where we have upper and lower connection, that should be at the end of the drogue fold. Everything is flat. What we want to avoid is folding over at the slink, folding over at the four point stitching because that creates a lump inside the pack job. If we have a lump inside the pack job, it could potentially impede the drogue from coming out of the pocket. So it is flat from end to end. We then fold over the drogue one third to the left, one third to the right, one third to the left. There's no rolling going on here. This is all folding. And then folding back one third to the right. So now we have created a flat drogue fold. There's no lumps in here. It is now the width and length of the Spandora pocket. And because we went right to the edge of that four point stitching, really the only drogue bridle left is enough to place it in the pocket cleanly. Now, this is a perfect drogue fold, but I can still screw it up just like a hot dog bun. It has an opening to it. This opening needs to be facing the back of the tandem instructor. If this fold over is facing forward, if I put it in upside down, as soon as the drogue comes off my hip, what is going to happen? What has to happen with the relative wind? It's going to mushroom. It's going to explode off our hip. So part of the packing cycle in this is to place the drogue in an orientation where that 
fold will actually be held shut. If the relative wing hits this, what has to happen? It holds it shut throughout the deployment. And now, because we did flat S folds, the drove, will, the bridle will pay out cleanly from hip off to the side of the tandem pair. That's the most critical part of this drone fold, is the orientation of the opening of the fold, that it is on the back of the container, not facing the front of the container. Okay, drove is in the pocket. Last but not least, any riggers in here? Show of hands, okay. Rigging concept, it's called applied violence. Right, it's a rigging technique. A little applied violence. All we're doing is flattening up the drove fold. So now, the drove is flat, it is smooth. It is the width and length of the pocket and hiding right here, there's the type four tape on the equator. So, watch how smooth this is. There is no hesitation, there is no um, difficulty in extracting the drove. This is going to be important to us because we're going to cover eventually the concept of priming. We see people leaving with the drove out. They do that because they lack confidence in their ability to extract the drove cleanly on a drove set. It's because their droves are not put into the pocket cleanly and are not able to leave the pocket freely. So rather than fix the problem, learn how to pack a drove, instructors band-aid the situation and they need the drogue extended, making it easier for them to grab it. While we are here, another benefit of this type four tape is that if the golf ball were to fall off and disappear on exit, the type four tape by itself makes for a handy drogue handle. So reaching into the pocket, we can put our hand around the type four tape and we can extract the drogue without the handle. So that is the correct drogue folding technique. <coughs> Any questions? Okay, I shall proceed then. So, we have to get away from the thought process that a drogue is like a pilot chute. In theory, they both act in a similar capacity. They're both designed to initiate a deployment. However, the drogue initiates a deployment in a much different manner than a pilot chute. A pilot chute one initiates an immediate deployment. Setting the pilot chute immediately deploys the main parachute. Yet for a tandem, setting the drogue is only intended to stabilize us. It does not initiate deployment until a secondary action occurs, and that is the release of the drogue. So they look similar, they have similar uh, features and similar designs, but they basically serve two different purposes during the actual activation process. One is to stabilize and then eventually deploy a parachute. The other is to deploy the parachute immediately. The other big difference between a pilot chute and a drogue is the mass of the two objects. A pilot chute is very light and very small. A drogue is very large and very heavy. What does that mean in terms of mass? We have to move that mass whether it's a pilot chute or a drogue. And if the pilot chute is light and small, it requires very little effort to put that pilot chute into the relative wind. If we use that same lack of effort, that same light drogue throw or same light pilot chute extraction technique for the drogue, which is much heavier and much larger, we're not going to get the same outcome. The drogue being heavier and larger needs much more force to place into the relative wind than the pilot chute does. So understanding that we do not treat our drogues like pilot chutes. They're two separate pieces of equipment that serve two separate purposes that need to be handled and operated individually per the, 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 um, the piece, whatever it is, whether it's a pilot chute versus a drogue. So we just covered priming. People prime because they lack confidence in their ability to extract the drogue. There's no other way to say it. It's not a good thing or a bad thing. It's not said to be insulting to anyone, but the fact is, a properly packed drogue does not have deployment difficulties. It doesn't matter whether you're six foot six, five feet tall, have long arms, small arms, whether you're really strong or really weak, doesn't matter. A properly folded drogue does not need to be primed. It is not in any of our manuals. I doubt the BPA has priming the drogue as a process in your manual. We don't have it at UPT. 
yet you will see people doing it. They're making up their own rules, their own processes, their own band-aid fixes to problems rather than addressing the core issue. Fold the drogue correctly, you will never have to prime your drogue. The other big issue that we see, and we saw this this morning with one of the videos that Noel showed, is when do we release the drogue? Here we have a drogue that has been is being released far past what we would call the drogue release point. What has to happen here? This is an illogical decision. Taking the drogue and bringing it out to here and holding it is illogical. We've now allowed the fabric to unfur unfurl. We've allowed the bridle to catch air. So that's all illogical stuff out of sequence. What now has to happen? He has to release this, right? And when he releases the drogue, the canopy fabric has to brush past the bridle. There's nowhere else for it to go but past the very bridle that it's attached to. That drogue deployment sequence, bringing the drogue out past your shoulder and then releasing it, that is the number one cause for uninflated drogue and toes. The entanglements that we see, numero uno, number one right here, is by holding on to the drogue too long during the drogue set. So that then begs the question, what is the appropriate point to release the drogue? So everything we do is based on the concept of mechanical advantage. We want to have the greatest mechanical advantage of getting that heavy, big piece of fabric out of that pocket into the relative wind. And the relative wind that we're placing it into is not right here. It's not behind us. It is off to our side about five to six feet, maybe two meters, two yards off to the side. So the travel of our arm is from the shoulder, elbow, wrist, fingers in logical order. And at the apex of our shoulder, as though we were trying to throw something in someone's face across from us, that is the release point. And it's one motion, okay? It's one clean motion. If we let go too early, it's gonna flop on our back and in our burble. If we let go too late, the bridle and the canopy are going to expand and inflate while we still have possession of it and then potentially create that entanglement behind us. So it is one firm motion at our shoulder, releasing the drogue. And I'm gonna show you some correct examples of that um, as we move forward in this. The next question is our hand position. How do we release the drogue? Well, there's two different possible ways of doing it. And while we haven't gone so far as to take a stance on one being better than the other, one is much better than the other. And you could do either, but one is much more efficient. I'm gonna start with the less efficient, the open palm. You will see tandem instructors reach back to set the drogue with an open palm. They will grab the golf ball and they will attempt to set the drogue to their side, okay? open palm, grip the golf ball, and away they go. Now, that is one option, and it does work. It can work repeatedly and consistently, but it's not the most efficient, it's not the strongest, it's not gonna give you the greatest force off to the side, and <clears throat> if the golf ball leaves, what happens? You're gonna go back and have to find the drogue again. So deploying the golf ball, if there's a problem, a malfunction of the kit, now you have to go back and try to set the drogue. And an open palm drogue grip, is not a great grip for trying to get the type four tape out. So if you do find yourself in that rare instance, the golf ball is left, and now you have to go back to the pocket to find the drogue. Finding it this way is very difficult, whereas an overhand grip, on the other hand, is very efficient. An overhand grip of the golf ball with the thumb indexed into the pocket around the type four tape, that is your strongest grip on the drogue, and as we extract it, it gives us the greatest force through our mechanical advantage. And if for some reason, if we just deploy the golf ball, because we don't do maintenance, when our hand returns back to the drogue pocket, our thumb indexes the interior of the pocket, our hand wraps around the type four tape, and we can instantly deploy the type four tape. I would jump that without the golf ball using just the type four tape as a handle every day with an overhand grip with extreme confidence in its ability to set cleanly. The golf ball is there as a guide and as a target, but the drogue itself, the type four tape properly folded, that can be deployed time and time again without incident or problem. But it comes down to whether or not we choose to use an open hand grip or an overhand grip. And I strongly recommend the overhand grip because it has a greater mechanical advantage. So <coughs> next item of business, body position. Okay. This is mildly embarrassing, so please try not to laugh. So the drogue itself only requires shoulder to hand. When I set the drogue, that's all my body motion is required. Right arm comes down to the drogue, 
left arm comes up above my head. Why is this left hand coming up? Neutral and stable. And then I set the drogue. That's the only body movement necessary. However, what we see in the field, twofold. One, we see the windmill effect, where instructors try to generate power by dropping their shoulders 90 degrees and throwing the drogue out to the side. So if I hold this body position long enough in tandem free fall, what has to happen? I'm going to roll over on my back, right? So I'm creating an asymmetrical body position to create a symmetrical action. It's not a logical decision. So look at your YouTube videos, go back, watch your drogue sets, and see if the motion's coming only from your shoulders or if you're getting a spine rotation. And if you are rotating your spine and your shoulders, fix it. All that's required is arch, reach, drogue set. The other one, if you guys have hockey here in the UK? Okay, the hip check. We try to generate power by hip checking the drogue off of our hip. That too is also an asymmetrical body position. So if we hold this position too long, it's gonna cause us to rotate over again onto our side. So very, very specific from the hips to the spine to the shoulders. There is no movement at all. The only movement comes from our shoulders outward. It's a very simple, smooth movement. So look at YouTube videos of yourself that is already out there in the public domain and ask yourself, am I using too much body input? Because it's these inputs that cause us to go unstable. If you've seen people reach back for the drogue and roll over on their back because of it, it's because their body wasn't neutral and stable and they used too many joints and too much body movement in setting the drogue. Next order of business, airspeed. How many of you guys jump Cessna 182s? It's a really slow airspeed exit. The drogue deployments out of Cessna 182s tend to be mushy and soft because it's a slow airspeed. Twin Otters tend to be 90 knots, 95 knots. King Airs, maybe 100 knots, 105. And you guys, military jump in C-130s, the exit speeds are 120, 125 knots. Sometimes you're slowing down to terminal because you're exiting so fast. The faster the airspeed, the more consistent the drogue throws. So this doesn't mean we can't set a drogue in low airspeed, we can. You'll see a helicopter drogue set before this is over. As long as you use the correct techniques, the airspeed doesn't really matter, but being aware that different airspeeds will have a different effect on how the drogue deploys is only gonna help you. Low airspeeds, they tend to be clunky and flimsy, so you really wanna get a good, deliberate, clean drogue set. Higher the airspeeds, it tends to help out um, and offset our skill by taking it off our shoulders and out of our hands a lot faster and a lot more deliberately. So I've already answered this unfortunately. What does that cause? Causes an uninflated drogue and toe. Presenting the drogue and releasing it, that's the number one reason as to how to cause an uninflated drogue and toe. So the next thing we want to talk about is the mindset. What does the mindset of being a tandem instructor sending a drogue mean? It means one, <coughs> that the setting of the drogue is a very calm process. The couple of videos I'm gonna show you, I want you to think about the calmness of the drogue throw of the instructor, admittedly, most of it's me, I think, but just because I didn't want to embarrass anybody else. Every drogue set should be a very calm experience. I've exited the aircraft, tandem free fall is the best part of my job. I get to actually skydive for three to eight seconds. I have achieved stability, and then I calmly reach back and I set the drogue. There's a difference between calmly reaching back for the drogue versus what we call cobra striking it, just getting our hand back there and trying to get it out. There should be no tension, there should be no fear, there should be no concern about how am I gonna get the drogue off my pocket, how am I gonna get it out into the clean air. Every drogue set should be a calm, deliberate act, one that we do confidently. I know <coughs> that as long as the drogue is folded the way it's supposed to be folded, I'm never gonna have a problem with setting my drogue. I'm confident every time I leave an aircraft, that drogue is exactly where it needs to be and it's folded exactly how it needs to be. So I'm gonna have a smooth transition into drogue fall. So every time I exit the aircraft, I'm calm in my drogue set, I'm confident in my drogue set, and I'm deliberately choosing to set the drogue. I'm not trying to drogue out of an unstable orientation. I'm not trying to get the drogue out because I lack confidence in my ability to be a tandem free faller. I make a deliberate decision to set the drogue only after I've achieved stability or as the stability transition occurs. What we want to avoid is the bullet time drogue throw. And what I mean by that, 
twofold. One, if any of you guys remember the Matrix bullet time, that was how they filmed all those cool things. But the other part about it is a bullet can either be one of two places. It's either in the chamber or it's been fired, right? You can't partially fire a bullet. You can't pull the trigger and then stop the deployment of the bullet halfway through and go, no, you know what, this doesn't look good. Let's, let's reset this. A drogue is exactly like a bullet. It's either in the pocket or it's being set. You cannot stop a drogue set midway because if you do, and here's a picture of it, the drogue starts to come out, we're unstable, and the instructor stops the drogue throw. Ready, fire, aim. Whoops. <laughs> so <coughs> somehow they, they survive this. Um, it's a, they, they actually get a reserve parachute out eventually. But the point in this is that not every one of your exits is going to be perfectly stable. Not every one of my exits is going to be perfectly stable. I'll even show you a video to prove it. I am not the most current tandem instructor in the world right now. But anytime I reach back for the drogue, if I lose stability, I'm not required to set the drogue. I'm going to return to a neutral body position. I'm going to achieve stability and then set the drogue with one exception. If I reach back to set the drogue and start to go unstable, if I've already started the extraction process, I must finish it. There is no trapping the drogue while we achieve stability because if we do, we're going to end up like this, gift wrapped in our bridle and our drogue fabric. And this is not a good place to be in. Okay? So. <coughs> If I could just get the uh, camera for a second to just look the other way. I want to show you a video. Um, nothing bad, but just to be fair to the people involved in this. And eventually, these sorts of things, they end up in entanglements. Okay? So here we have a drogue entanglement around the ankle. And every time this is addressed, the response is that this is how I've done it for years. They time the drogue throw. And I use the broken clock analogy. Even a broken clock is right twice a day. Well, these guys get it right thousands of times until they don't get it right, and they throw a drogue around their ankle, and the result is an unnecessary reserve deployment. And this is all based on that blue-green-blue blue philosophy. Roll out of the aircraft, blue-green-blue, blue, time the drogue. And this is the number one issue we are fighting right now in tandem skydiving. We had an incident a couple years ago where a tandem instructor unfortunately threw a drogue around their ankle, and the resulting outcome based on some missed emergency procedures and timings was unfortunately double fatality. It was, it was a horrible situation. And through the investigation, we basically learned that that unstable drogue set was the instructor's normal procedure. There were videos in the public domain of this very same instructor prior to this incident rolling out of an aircraft, blue, green, blue, setting a drogue. And upon further investigation, again, unfortunately, but we, we owe it to ourselves to address this, it wasn't just that instructor. It was basically everybody in the drop zone. The culture of the drop zone was roll out of an aircraft and set the drogue in between instabilities, blue, green, blue. So the incident really could have happened to anybody. The entanglement could have happened to anyone in the drop zone because the culture of that drop zone, that exit culture, was a nor new normal situation as opposed to the correct way to do it those instructors would not have passed the very course they took to earn their rating based on how they're exiting an aircraft. But if I do something unusual or uh, inappropriate, it might be unusual or inappropriate once. If I do it more than once, it becomes normal. And then if Ben starts to do it, it becomes even more normal. And if Hank starts to do it, next thing you know, if everybody's doing it that way, it seems right. It seems OK, right? So that's what the, why these presentations are so important in this time together, why your participation in this is so critical and why I'm so grateful you're here is that hopefully most of you, if not all of you, will take a moment of pause and assess what you're doing. And it might be drogue throws, it might be exits, it might be canopy flying, you might find something, passenger harness fitting, something that you were taught to do correctly that deviated into an incorrect procedure or behavior that you can now fix here on the ground because it is so much easier to fix it here than to have to deal with it up there, myself included. Every time I put a tandem rig on and I go out of an aircraft, I know I'm being judged more than anybody. Anything that I do, good or bad, that ends up on Facebook or social media, I know there's going to be judgment. So I have to always reflect almost daily on how it is I'm performing as a tandem instructor. And I'm human. I make the same mistakes everyone else does. And so I'm always trying to analyze what am I doing right and what, am I, what can I do to improve my processes. So I would encourage you guys to do that as well. So what does correct look like? Well, <coughs> correct looks like this, basically. The drogue set is a lateral projection. OK? 
okay? The drogue is going out beside me into clean air. Out here, into the relative wind, that's where the drogue needs to go, folded and clean. And you'll see the drogue is still folded. It's being held shut by the relative wind, a clean drogue deployment. And why I love this picture, slightly off kilter because I'm still coming down the hill, but I'm stable. The drogue travel of the bridle, the relative wind catches the bridle and the drogue as it's deploying and lifts it cleanly into the air above me. That orientation is a goal of every drogue set. Lateral projection into clean air, still folded, allowing the drogue to pay out without anything happening to the canopy fabric, no mushrooming of the canopy, and it then gets brought above you and behind you. Releasing at the shoulder apex, my arm is just lateral to my hip. I've just released it at the most ergonomically uh, correct point, the strongest point, and the drogue stays folded. That's what every drogue throw should look like and can look like if we fold the drogue correctly, if we use the correct technique, and if we are calm, confident, and deliberate with every drogue set that we make. So I've said this a couple times, I'll say it again. Preventing problems before we leave the aircraft are so much easier than fixing them after we leave the aircraft. And the drogue set, this is, is of all the X factors in our jump, Mark, not to put you on the spot, but how long is the bridle? It's long, right? 12 feet? Yeah, it's 12 feet. 12 foot long bridle. We've got massive piece of fabric, a 54 inch drogue attached to that. Four legs, four arms, two heads, and two bodies traveling upwards of 180 miles an hour. And we need to get that folded piece of fabric and all that bridle out into clean air time and time and time again. And that's the true skill set of the professional tandem instructor, to be able to make that happen over and over and over again, not based on luck, not based on timing, not based on the broken clock philosophy, but based on knowledge and verification that the drogue is folded correctly, based on an understanding of the correct body mechanics on how to put the drogue into clean air beside us, not behind us, and having the mental state that we are calm, we are confident, and we are deliberate. We are choosing to put the drogue into clean air. We are not putting the drogue out there to save our lives. We're not putting the drogue out there to prevent instability. We're, we are declaring to the world we know how to skydive. I am a tandem instructor. I am capable of tandem free fall for three to eight seconds, however long it takes to achieve stability. And then, and only then, am I gonna deliberately choose to set the drogue. And if we do that, the likelihood of having a drogue problem basically goes to zero. And if you look at your emergency procedure tree, how many of your procedures deal with drogue entanglements? Arms, legs, uh, uninflated drogue and toes, et cetera. You can remove a large portion of your emergency procedure tree, you can tear it up, throw it out, if you have a good drogue set. And who wouldn't want to have that safer environment to work in? So, to, I'm gonna show you a couple of videos, but before I do, to conclude, <coughs> Pack the drogue correctly. If you show up at a new drop zone as a tandem instructor, what's the first thing you should do? Pull a drogue out on the ground. Find out if it's being packed correctly. Why? Because it's so much better to find out here on the ground that it's not packed correctly than at 10,000 feet having left a 182 to find out the packers aren't following procedures. Two, use proper technique. Three, be calm. Four, be confident. Five, avoid the new normal. Avoid the blue, green, blue drogue throw and then put it all together. I'm going to show you a couple of videos of what that looks like now, and then we'll wrap this up. Yeah. This, my tandem passenger here, uh, since the picture's up, her name is He Kexen. She's a gold medal gymnast from China. She was first, um, 2008 and 2012 were the two Olympics she was in, and I was in China teaching a course. They asked me to take her on a tandem jump last time I was there. I think she weighed about 80 pounds soaking wet. So she was a, a tiny little thing, but a great passenger. So. Let me show you some couple of videos here. So I end up upside down, right? We, we rolled out and Mark did offer to, to correct this and teach me how to exit an aircraft.
drogue throw into clean air. So this is a great video because it illustrates exactly what I was talking about very clearly about the ability to set the drogue horizontally into clean air and what it looks like. Exit of the aircraft. Stable, neutral. Drogue is out beside me laterally. It's still folded, still folded, still folded, still folded, still folded, still folded. It is all the way above me. The relative wind that came from beside me, all this air on my back is dead air. It's a big burble. It wants to pull the bridle in. It wants to pull the fabric in. So I'm working against all those negative forces by putting the drogue horizontally as cleanly as I can in the relative wind, allowing it to reach all the way above the burble, and then and only then does it actually start to inflate. So that should be the goal, whether it's a helicopter or C-130, airspeed you know, related, high speed, low speed, or anything in between, that sequence will occur, whether it's a Twin Otter, a King Air, a 182, if you follow that procedure. Put the drogue into clean air, properly folded, let the relative wind take that folded drogue above you and behind you, above and outside of your burble, and you will have a clean drogue deployment every single time. So I'll conclude this with one last little two minute video. I just downloaded this this morning, we just made it. It doesn't matter whether you're jumping on Antarctica, jumping here, anywhere else in the world. Attention to detail. There is a correct way to set the drogue and there is an incorrect way to set the drogue. The problem with the incorrect way to set the drogue is we can still get away with it time and time and time again. And if I were to tell your customers that an incorrect drogue set had about a one in 10,000 likelihood of an entanglement, versus a correct drogue set and a correctly folded drogue having like a one in a million chance of entanglement or problem, which one would your customer prefer? One in 5,000 or one in a million, right? They want the one in a million. They deserve those odds. They deserve the best odds we can give them. So as we rush through our seasons, as we rush through our days, as we rush through every jump we try to make, just remember that everything we do that has a successful positive outcome is not by chance. Success is the logical outcome of good decisions and good procedures and good technique. 
incidents and the bad things that happen by the opposite side of the coin are always the logical outcome of illogical decisions and poor actions. So I thank you guys again for taking the time to sit with us. Um, you are the people that are going to lower the incident rates in the future because the gear is not going to evolve much beyond where it already is. We've fixed all the major problems of tandem skydiving from a gear perspective. If Bill were here, he would tell you that. I think he said it last year. At this point, we can still make the gear better, but incidents regarding equipment are almost unheard of now. There's still, anything's still possible, but almost unheard of. The majority of the incidents that we deal with as instructors and as examiners and as federations, it's human error. It's fixing the ap application and operation of the gear, us as the operators. And every one of you has the ability to not just polish and correct your own procedures, but to go home and be the evangelist to those around you that work with you to help improve their uh, performance as well. And if you do that, then we will see a dramatic drop in tandem incidents. So we as the instructors have the ability to drastically reduce incident rates in tandem jumping through understanding and better operation of the gear. So I challenge all of you guys, two things. Please do two things for me. One, go home and self-evaluate. Go to, and go to YouTube, go to Facebook, all the things about you that is in the public realm See what's out there, because that's what you're judged on. That's what I'm judged on, that's what we're all judged on. And if there's anything you can fix, fix it. Fix it now, and if you don't have the answer, you guys have tremendously experienced examiners and safety and training officers here. My email is tom at uptvector. You're always welcome to email me or mark at uptvector, email us. But the second thing I need you to do, has to happen, I need you guys to go back and talk to those that didn't make it here. Explain to them, everything you've learned. And again, it's not about forcing your procedures or opinions on someone. We've not told you to do anything since we've been here. We've simply presented information, asked you to consider it as professionals, and if you agree with it, adapt it, adopt it, and then spread the word. And if you do that, we're gonna have next year's presentation, less incidents, and the year after that, less and so on. We can be incident-free in our sport, it is possible. So thank you guys uh, for the opportunity to speak to you. Hope it was valuable. Just a quick show of hands. Did somebody get something out of this presentation that you can go back with and fix and correct and polish? Awesome. Then my time was well spent. I thank you guys, it was a privilege.